you got your Bible with you today, if you'll make your way to Psalm number 78. Psalm number 78. Just some general observations coming from Psalm number 78 today, just relative to telling and relative to teaching and relative to trusting and relative to thinking. Telling, teaching, trusting, and thinking. Thinking in terms of the basics of life today, I was up pretty early this morning and I was reminded of a, a song by that title, The Basics of Life. And I look around at kind of the world that we're living in today and, and that song was written a good number of years ago, 25 or 30, I think. But it just has application today in, in thinking about the worldview of the basics of life, the, what the world tells us that we need. One researcher recorded this for us, just in terms of what a person needs by way of the basics of life. A person needs to have a compass for success. A person needs to be self-regulated as a leader. A person needs to be able to manage their emotions. They need to be able to stay optimistic. They need to be able to exercise responsibility. They need to be in charge. They need to surround themselves with success. They need to enjoy the journey of success. They need to be able to expand capability. They need to be able to create luck. They need to be able to change the changes. They need to be able to up their emotional intelligence. They need to be able to continue to improve and they need to be able to live well and do good. That's what one researcher concluded that would be relative to the basics of life. How would a person get through life? How would a person navigate life? I brought with me the words to the song, The Basics of Life. I even listened to it on the way over to the church this morning just to remind myself. I won't sing it this morning, but Josh gave me the opportunity to do so. The songwriter recorded these words, we've turned a page for a new day has dawned. We've rearranged what is right and what's wrong. Somehow we've drifted so far from the truth that we can't get back home. Where are the virtues that once gave us light? Where are the morals that grounded our lives? Someday we all will awake and look back just to find what we've lost. We need to get back to the basics of life, a heart that is pure and a love that is blind, a faith that is fervently grounded in Christ, the hope that endures for all times. These are the basics. We need to get back to the basics of life. And so we come to Psalm number 78, a psalm that's given to us by Asaph, and Asaph was a temple music leader under David and Solomon both, and not only was he a worship or a, a, a music leader in the temple, but also his children. And some 128 of Asaph's children made it back from the time of exile to continue that ministry of temple worship. So Asaph understood worship. He understood the love of the Lord. He understood what it meant to me to leave a meaningful legacy. He understood what it meant to communicate these principles of truth that he's going to lay out for us today. He was speaking to us in Psalm number 78 from his heart, from deep in his heart with a passion for the God that spoke the universe into existence. And by way of telling, Psalm number 78, verse number one, Asaph says this, he says, listen, O my people, to my instruction Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we, which we have heard and that we've, we've known, and our fathers have told us. Verse number four, we will not conceal them from our children. We will not hide them. We will not conceal them from our children, but tell them to the generation to come. The praises of the Lord and his strength and his wondrous works that he has done. And just in terms of the responsibilities that you and I have to the generation that's coming behind us, just in my lifetime, 
to see how things have digressed within our culture, within our society, and just to kind of step back and to kind of take a hold and take an account of where we are in our communicating of things to the generation that's coming behind us. I think we'd all have to assess this morning that we've not done our best to communicate these things, these truths about God, about his strength, about his praises, about the wonders of his works. We've not done a really great job of communicating that to the generation that's coming behind us. Oh, we've done an okay job. We've done pretty good, but I wouldn't say that we've done our best. And he's reminding us of how important that is that you and I pass on to the generation that's coming behind us about the praises of the Lord, about how we go about praising the Lord, what that means in our lives by definition. Oh, we give it titles and we give it attachments and we have, you know, now in our church service today, we're going to have, this is our time of praise and worship and we're going to identify that. But what does that mean for you and I as we relate our praises about the God that spoke the universe into existence, about the God that created you and about the God that created me? And how do we go about communicating that to the generation that's coming behind us? So important that we be able to do that. Just to be able to speak openly and honestly and frankly with them. Just got finished in our small group a few moments ago uh, talking to a group of people about what it means to tell your story about your journey in Christ, about what God's doing in your life, about how you're praising God and what are the good things that you could communicate to others around you. It's important that we be able to do that. And then he talks about in there about our being able to communicate about the strength of God. Now, here's one that ought to get your attention because we're living in a time right now when, you know, people are living in fear of what's going to happen next and what are we going to do and what calamity is going to come next. Man, if you would have told us 12 months ago, hey, in July of next year, you're not going to be able to get within six feet of another person. You're going to have to wear a mask. You're going to have to wash your hands five, six, seven, eight times a day. All these things are going to be in place, not because it's a moral obligation to the people around us, but this is going to be mandated by the government that controls the, the state that we live in. These are the things that we need you to do. I don't think anybody would have believed that 12 months ago. But I'm going to tell you one thing that I do know. I do know that God is in control. I do know that God is sovereign. I do know that God is aware. God is aware if we wear a mask or don't wear a mask. God is aware of the virus. God's aware of the cure for the virus. God's aware of all these things. And we are aware of God's strength and his might. And what Asaph is communicating here is he's just reminding these people, man, we serve a God that's really strong. We serve a God that was able to part the Red Sea. We serve a God that provided us the land of Canaan. We serve a God that gave us great victory in those circumstances. But for you and I, when we start thinking about God's strength and we start thinking about the great and the wondrous works of God, the great and the wondrous works of Jesus... I got some of these, I, I probably didn't get these in chronological order, so forgive me for that, but Jesus changed water into wine, John chapter 2. Jesus cu cured a nobleman's son in John chapter 4. There was the great hall of fish in Luke chapter 5. Jesus cast out unclean spirits in Mark chapter 1. Jesus cured Peter's mother-in-law of a fever in Mark chapter 1. Jesus healed a leper in Mark chapter 1. And Jesus healed the centurion's servant in Matthew chapter 8. And Jesus raised the widow's son from the dead in Luke chapter 7. And Jesus stilled the storm in Matthew chapter number 8. And Jesus cured two demoniacs in Matthew chapter 8. And Jesus cured the paralytic in Matthew chapter 9. And Jesus raised the, ruler, raised the ruler's daughter from the dead in Matthew chapter 9. And Jesus cured a woman of an issue of blood in Luke chapter 8. And Jesus opened the eyes of two blind men in Matthew chapter number 9. And Jesus, and Jesus loosed the tongue of a man who could not speak in Matthew chapter 9. And Jesus healed an invalid man in, in, at the pool of Bethesda in John chapter number 5. And Jesus restored a withered hand in Matthew chapter number 12. And Jesus cured a demon-possessed man in Matthew chapter 12. And Jesus fed at least 5,000 people in Matthew chapter 14. And Jesus helped a woman of Capernaum in Matthew chapter, he healed a woman of Capernaum in Matthew 15. And Jesus cured a deaf and mute man in Mark chapter number seven. And Jesus fed at least 4,000 people in Matthew chapter number 15. Jesus opened the eyes of a blind man in Mark chapter eight. And Jesus cured a boy who was plagued by a demon in Matthew chapter 17. And Jesus opened the eyes 
of a man born blind in John chapter 9, and Jesus cured a woman who had, a, who had been afflicted for 18 years in Luke chapter number 13, 18. And he goes on, and Jesus cured a man of droopsy in Luke 14, and Jesus cleansed the lepers in Luke 17, and Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11, and Jesus opened the eyes of two blind men in Matthew chapter 20, and Jesus caused a fig tree to wither in Matthew chapter number 21, and Jesus restored the, the ear of the high priest, the ear of the high priest's servant in Luke chapter number 22, and then Jesus also rose from the dead. These are the miracles of God. These are the miracles of Jesus himself. And it's your obligation, it's my obligation to communicate that to the generation that's coming behind. And not just communicate it as if, oh, it may or may not have happened. We're to communicate it with the absolute authority and conviction. It happened. He did this. That man's ear got cut off and Jesus picked it up and he put it back on his head. Jesus was crucified, dead, and he was put in that tomb, and he rose again from the dead. And it's your obligation, it's my obligation to communicate that to the generation that's coming behind. We're supposed to tell them. And then the psalmist goes on in, in verse number five, and, and he reminds us, not only are we to tell, but you and I have an obligation to teach also. Verse number five, Psalm 78, for he established a testimony in Jacob. He appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers, that they should teach them to their children. Their job was not only to tell, but their job was also to teach to the next generation. I know a thing or two about catfishing. I know a thing or two about catfishing because my grandfather taught me about catfishing. He taught me so much about catfishing, I don't like catfishing. I don't like catfish only if they're fried and cooked and ready to eat. I don't want to go try to catch them. I don't want to try to take them off a hook. I don't want to fool with them. I've seen the result of a fin stuck through a hand. I don't want to fool with anything like that. But my grandfather taught me and took the time to teach me how to do that. Somebody had to teach you how to mow the yard. The old mower that I learned how to mow on had one of those old school cranks and you turned it around and you cranked it and then you flipped it back over and that started the mower. Dangerous, but effective. Somebody had to teach me that you mow in these lines and you, you know, I was watching somebody teach their son how to mow the other day and he was just kind of haphazardly going around the yard. He's not been taught yet that there's a uniformity in how the yard gets mowed. I like my yard cut a particular way. I cut it in diagonals. When Susan cuts the yard, she does not cut in diagonals. But I don't complain because she's cut the yard, and I'm happy that, that, that she's done that. But yeah, our obligation is not only to tell of all these great things, but we're to teach these things to our children. He goes on there in verse number 6, and he says this, that the generation to come might know, even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children. Now, this was meaningful in their culture because this is how history was communicated from one generation to the next is an oral history. Our generation is lazy, and we don't communicate our history from one generation to the next orally. We now will use a phone, a computer, we'll use some other method to be able to communicate that. How effective would it be for grandma or grandpa to sit down with the generation coming behind and tell them and teach them and train them the things of the generation? These are the things that God has done. These are the praises. This is God's strength. And these are the miracles of God. And this is what he's done. Not just to simply hand them a CD or put on some kind of a Veggie Tale movie, but to take the time to tell them and to teach them and to train them so that the generation to come might know and that they, their children that are yet to be born, that they may arise and that they may tell their children. The verse number 70 says this, that they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. 
You see, not only are we responsible for telling the generation coming behind, and not only are we responsible for teaching the generation that's coming behind, but you and I have an obligation to trust. Listen to what he says. That they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God, but to keep his commandments. If it's not important to you, it's not going to be important to the generation coming behind. If it's not important to you, it's not going to be important to the generation coming behind. And we're seeing this play out in living color every single day. And we're scratching our heads and we're wringing our hands and we're trying to figure out what's happened. I can't believe this is going on all around us. And it is going on all around us. And it has to do with the fact that we've not done an effective job of telling and teaching and trusting. We've not done all we can do. We've not communicated clearly that, man, this is really important to us. I want you to know this. The phrase right there where it says, keep his commandments. That phrase, keep his commandments or keep my commandments, occurs 56 times in the Bible. Keep his commandments or keep my commandments occurs 56 times in the Bible. John chapter 15 and verse number 10, the Bible says this, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. It's not just enough that we have knowledge about God. It's not just enough that we know who he is. But man, we've got this responsibility and it's an enormous one that we'll be able to communicate to those that are in the next generation and those that are in our generation and the people that we surround ourselves with that we trust him. We trust God absolutely. And I'm going to demonstrate that by following his commandments. I'm going to make that a part about the fabric of my life. So I'm just asking what happens when we fail to communicate this truth to the generation that's coming behind us? That's easy to answer. All you have to do is turn on the TV. And you see what happens when we fail to do our job, when we fail to get done what needs to be done for the generation that's coming behind us. And and it's just rolling out right in front of us. And we're wondering, wow, is there anything we can do? Is there anything we can do to stop the trend? Absolutely. Start being a person who's willing to tell the truth. Start being a person who's willing to teach the truth. Start being a person that is willing to abide in that and to know that it's real and to be able to communicate. So telling and teaching and trusting Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse number 13, the Bible says this, For whosoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they, and how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are those How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news of good things. Trusting in God. Knowing that we're doing a good job of telling. Knowing that we're doing a good job of teaching. Knowing that we're trusting. Verse number 8, Psalm number 78, picking that up. Asaph goes down the line and he's like, This is what we need to be doing. This is what needs to happen. These are the things. It's the telling and it's the teaching and it's the trusting. And then he gets into this calamity that's happened. He gets into what in the world is going on. And so this is the part where you and I really need to be thinking. Listen to what he says right there in verse number 8. Psalm 78, verse number 8. And not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart and whose spirit was not faithful to God. 
And not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart and whose spirit was not faithful to God. A stubborn generation. Another word for stubborn is stiff-necked. It is found in Acts chapter 7, 7 and verse number 51. You stiff-necked people, your hearts and your ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Eugene Peterson in his translation, the message, took that uh, context right there in Acts chapter number 7, beginning in verse number 51, and Peterson renders it this way. And you continue to be bullheaded, and you continue to be bullheaded. Calluses on your hearts. Calluses on your hearts. And flaps on your ears. You're not listening. Deliberately ignoring the Holy Spirit. You're just like your ancestors. Was there ever a prophet? There was there ever a prophet who didn't get the same treatment? Your ancestors killed anyone who dared to talk about the coming of the just one. And you've kept up the family tradition. Traitors and murderers, all of you. You have God's law handed to you. You have God's law handed to you by the angels. And he finishes and he says this, it's gift wrap. And he says, and you squandered it. This rebellious generation. Jeremiah chapter 19 and verse number 15, the Bible says this, this is what the Lord Almighty God of Israel says, listen, I'm going to bring on this city all and all the villages around it Every disaster I pronounced against them because they were stiff-necked and would not listen to my words. Isaiah chapter 30 and verse number 9, he says this, For those are rebellious people. For these are rebellious people. They're deceitful children. Children of, un they're unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction. He reminds us there in Psalm 78 that they did not prepare their hearts. Their hearts were not prepared. Jeremiah 5 and verse number 23 says this, but these people have stubborn and rebellious hearts. They have blinded, they have turned aside and they've gone away. 1 Kings 8 and, and verse number 58 says this, that he may incline our hearts to himself to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments. This idea of preparing the heart, this idea of thinking about what's going on and He's reminding that generation, they didn't prepare their hearts. And if we're not careful, as the songwriter says, we've drifted away. We need to get back to the basics of life. We need to get back to the things that are important. We need to get back to the things that are meaningful. We need to get back to the things that are going to change lives. And he does such a great job of bringing us there. He also reminds us in that text that their spirit was not faithful to God. Their spirit was not faithful to God. Are you faithful to God or are you faithful to the things of God? Are you faithful to God or are you faithful to the things of God? Charles Spurgeon said this, how altogether vain is the unregenerate man. Array him in the best that nature, that nature and grace can supply. Array him in the best that nature and grace can supply. And he remains a helpless coward in a holy war so long as he lacks a loyal faith in his God. Now that's a mouthful right there. How altogether vain is the unregenerate man. Array him in the best that nature and grace can supply. And he remains a helpless coward in the holy war so long as he lacks loyal faith in God. Verse number nine, Psalm 78, the psalmist says this, so the sons of Ephraim 
were archers. And they were equipped with bows and arrows, yet they turned back in the day of battle. Now, this was an interesting add-in right here, because as Spurgeon just mentioned, these warriors were equipped with everything they need to be able to be successful in battle. And yet, in the day of the battle, they turned from the battle. And so, for you and I today, what that means is, man, what thing do we do without today? What do, I mean, what could we possibly, in Longview, Texas, in the year 2020, what in the world could we be lacking in our battle in a holy war? But yet more often than not, we find ourselves retreating and we find ourselves running in that situation rather than engaging and going forward. He goes on to say this, he said, they did not keep the commandment of God and they refused to walk in his law. These are God's people. He's not talking about a group of people that aren't, I mean, he's talking about God's people. He's talking about his people. He's talking about the people that he serves. They did not keep the commandment, the covenant of God, and they refused to walk in his law. They forgot his deeds. And they forgot the miracles that he had shown them. Telling and teaching and trusting and thinking. A.W. Tozer recorded this thought, true faith is never found alone. It is always accompanied by expectation. True faith is never found alone. It is always accompanied by expectation. The man who believes the promises of God expects to see them fulfilled. Where there is expectation Where there is no expectation, there is no faith. Where there's no expectation, there is no faith. I heard a story this past week, and it really just kind of summarized this idea of the telling and the teaching and the trusting and the thinking. And the story involves a professor of religious studies at Moody Bible Institute, Michael Rednick. And Michael grew up in a Jewish home in New York. He was the son of Holocaust survivors. Michael's father lost his wife and multiple children during the Holocaust in the concentration camp at Auschwitz. He survived. His his father survived. He got remarried, and his second wife died giving birth to their daughter. The daughter subsequently died in a drowning accident in Berlin. The father got married a third time. They decided to move to the United States of America. They moved to the U.S., settled in New York. Michael was born, he had sisters, and about 20 years after that decision was made for them to move to New York, about 20 years after that, Michael, his mother, and his sisters all gave their lives to Christ. The father was so angry, he divorced his wife and disowned the children and moved back to Israel. Michael, over the span of time, attempted to contact his father many times, trying to reach out to him, trying to communicate with his father. His father had cut off all communication with him. When Michael's father died, his aunt communicated to the family. No one is to communicate with Michael about his father dying, about his father passing away. One of the cousins disobeyed that instruction and contacted Michael. He said, Michael, I just want you to know your father's passed away. My mom told me not to call you, but I've called you anyway. I knew you'd want to know that your dad has passed away. He said, oh yeah, by the way, 
Your father was in the hospital when he passed away, and the day before he died, a woman came into the hospital room to visit her own father who was sick and saw the name Reldnick on the wall and looked at your father and said, do you happen to know Michael Reldnick? In which your father replied, he used to be my son. He is dead to me now. That woman took that opportunity to move closer to Michael Relnick's father's bed and in that moment took the time to tell, to teach, and to trust concerning the gospel of Jesus. Now, Dr. Relnick says he doesn't know this woman. He's never met her, and she's never attempted to contact him. He's not clear as to whether or not his father accepted Christ that day or not. But one thing is for sure, God will exhaust every opportunity to make sure that you and I and others around us hear the gospel. A man who had become stubborn and stiff-necked, rejecting all attempts at someone to reach out to him with the gospel. Stubborn stiff-necked, rejecting, denouncing his own family. And God still sent someone to his bedside to communicate the truth of the gospel to him. We owe it to the generation coming behind us to tell, to teach, to trust, and to think. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we love you. We just praise you and thank you for your goodness, your greatness, your kindness, and your mercy. Father, I thank you for truth of Scripture. I thank you for Dr. Relnick's story about how the gospel transformed his life that brought him to a place where he is now teaching others. He's telling others. He's training others. Father, there are so many stories like his in, in our lives and within people around us. And we're thankful for those stories of transformed lives. And Father, I just pray that in our life, in our church, in, in our city, that we would take our responsibility seriously to tell and to teach and to trust and to think. Father, we're so thankful for your great love for us. We're thankful that you loved us enough, Father, that you sent your only son, Jesus, to die for our sins. Father, help us to not be stubborn and stiff-necked. Help us to not lose our excitement for the miracles that God's done in our lives. We thank you for Jesus, and we thank you for salvation in his name. Amen. I know that some of you are probably wondering, you're looking at the screen and you're wondering about the count that was on the screen. I don't see it up there anymore. There it is up in the top right. Um, as that number continues to roll, those are the number of people that have died and have gone on into eternity during the time that I've been speaking this morning. That's how many people have died and they've gone on into eternity just in the small amount of time that I've been speaking this morning. These are real life people. These are human souls. And you and I in our life, we owe it to the generation coming behind to do our best to communicate the truth to them. So as Josh comes to uh, end our service today, I, I just want you to know, uh, I, I don't know where you are spiritually today, what's going on in your life, but man, I... Would you just be willing today just to communicate with God and just to ask him to instill in you a desire to want to tell others? The desire to want to tell the truth to others. So Josh, you come and lead us.